So I hope you're all enjoying the discussion so far and gleaning insights that's going to help your upcoming meetings over the next two days and your portfolio more broadly. So next up, we have a session that's certainly in that vein, a fundamental outlook on the global economy in 2023. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce your moderator, Melissa Lee, host of Fast Money and Options Action on CNBC, and her two guests, David Zervos, Chief Market Strategist at Jefferies, and Mike Wilson, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. <laughs> so we were joking in the back there that these two guys are two peas in a pod. So I'm just going to start off with saying, how low can we go? <laughs> how low do you think we're going to go? Depends on the market. Uh, yeah, we'll start with equities, I guess, and David can chime in, and we'll talk bonds as well, because they're related, right? I mean, last year was uh, one of the worst years we've ever had because of rate normalization. We were kind of kidding, too. A year ago, it's like, does anybody think the Fed's going to raise more than 50 basis points? And, and, and they didn't. I mean, basically, the market didn't price it until they were told that they were going to, you know, continue to go. And they're going to continue to go. Uh, you know, we, we both agree that there, there's no cuts in the near future unless something really catastrophic happens. I guess my view in the equity market now is more centered on earnings. And, uh, you know, we, last year was about the Fed. That was kind of the fire. Now it's about the slowdown, some of which is re re reaction to the re higher rates some of it is a payback from the pandemic, and this thesis around negative operating leverage, the idea that higher inflation you know, leads to higher nominal GDP, but it also leads to higher operating leverage, and we're now in a negative operating leverage cycle. So I would say uh, our view is pretty out of consensus. We think this year's earnings will be kind of in the 190 range. The street is anywhere between, say, 215 from a top-down perspective. David can tell you what he thinks. Um, and then the bottoms up is still 230. So we think that earnings cycle is gonna play through even without a recession because of that negative operating leverage. So I think we can trade low 3,000s. Um, won't stay there very long. There's too much capital out there. Um, probably at a minimum, we retest the October lows. Uh, and I'll just finish up by saying, you know, we've had a, a pretty good rally to start the year, but I just wanna remind folks that that's normal. We have a January effect. Uh, the laggards always lead in the beginning. That's what we've seen, a lot of tax loss selling in the fourth quarter that's now bounced back. And, and I think a lot of folks are saying, well, maybe this reset or opportunity is going to happen later in the year now. And I think, given the technicals and the way we're set up, I think if we're going to have it, it's going to be in the first quarter. Hopefully, we'll get that buying opportunity, and the second half will be a bit better. David? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's some subtle differences, I would say, in, in how we're looking at things. But the broad story is not that different. Um, I, I think the one sticking point that I really pushed up with clients last year, both when we hit the lows in June and then again in the fall toward the 35, 3600 level was, um, you know, hey, this is a, a recession that has a lot of nominal growth behind it, a lot of inflation behind it. It's not a deflationary recession. And that's really important. You know, when you get deflation and you have a lot of debt and leverage, it's a problem. That's the old Irving Fisher debt deflation spiral uh, Great Depression work that Ben Bernanke was scared to death of in 08 and 09 and kind of why he did what he did with QE 1, 2, and 3. He didn't want to go there and he was willing to risk inflation to make sure we didn't go into that 30s or Japan style deflationary scenario. So you have to step back and say this is not the kind of recession that you have studied a lot in the history books or lived through in the global financial crisis, it's a high inflation recession. And, you know, in 2021, we had 12% nominal GDP growth, seven inflation, five real. This past year, we're probably going to have about eight, maybe, maybe a little bit more, somewhere in that range, seven percent inflation, one real. These are huge numbers. Prior to the global, uh, prior to COVID, we were basically had nominal GDP at three and a half, which is one and three quarter real, one and three quarter inflation. So we're running this economy three times faster in nominal terms. Just step back and make sure you think about it. Three times faster in nominal terms. So nominal variables like profits, like earnings, like 
valuations, stocks are a nominal asset, they're denominated in dollar terms, they're gonna get a tailwind from that. You don't get the Fed helping you, you don't have the Fed, the Fed hurting you in fact, because they're trying to get that inflation down, but it's really hard to, to kind of, for me to pencil in crashes below that 35, 3600 level when I've got such a big nominal GDP tailwind that by the way is still with us. That, that, that's income that is kind of in the system. So I, I think that nominal cushion story that we told a lot last year is still very much in place this year. Um, and on the opposite side, on the upside, you just have a Fed that if you get the opportunity, or if it gets the opportunity uh, at 4,300 or 4,400, kind of like what happened before Jackson Hole last year, you know, if the market gets really up, uh, excited, says, hey, there's not even a soft landing, there's just a no landing, we're ready to run back to the all-time highs, Jay's just gonna turn around and go, you know what, that's great that you think that, but I can get inflation down faster, thanks very much, and he's gonna start talking really hawkishly and potentially even acting more hawkishly. So, I think you've got a pretty defined range, Melissa. Right. You were actually, David, um, an economist at the Federal Reserve right yeah. after graduate school, and you also went back as an advisor during the GFC. So I'm wondering, you know, in your time at the Fed, walking through the halls, do they care about market reaction? I mean, do you think Jay Powell is actually thinking this you know, tomorrow afternoon that he does not want to see the market rally after he gives that press conference? Every Fed governor, every Fed president, Everyone on that second floor of the Eccles building at 20th and Constitution has a Bloomberg terminal. And it's on every day. And they're watching the tenure note, they're watching the S&P, they're watching the dollar, they're looking at whatever their pet peeve is. I guess some of these presidents that are gone after a few years were watching a few more things than that um, out of Boston and Dallas. But um, yes. The answer is they really care about the sentiment that they're trying to push back into the market. I think they, they look at sentiment, they look at indicators of expectations. I mean, in the end, what are they really, what's their most important variable? It's inflation expectations. It's what, what is the market expecting for inflation? And that is how you know, they're setting real rates and setting the accommodative or non-accommodative side of monetary policy. So I think they care a lot and I do think you know, with inflation still as high as it is, they don't want to see a runaway market. They don't want to come out of this with another pick back up in inflation mid-year and have it look like uh, a mistake a la Arthur Burns in the 70s, which is, hey, you declare victory and you say, I'm done, I'm not tightening anymore, and then all of a sudden, we're going back up to five or six or higher on the PC. This is not where Jay wants to be. 100% that's the situation he wants to avoid at all costs. Would rather have a deeper recession than go there. So there's really no upside to coming out saying we're gonna pause. I mean, the markets are really hoping to hear that. The markets are really hoping that the Fed is going to be there for them as they have been in the past. But it sounds like, at least Mike, it sounds like you don't think that is the case. That the Fed has another agenda here and it's not aligned with investors necessarily. No, and I think the China reopening is a big factor too, yeah. right? So we've seen gasoline prices are up 30% in the last 45 days. Okay, that's a big bugaboo for the consumer, and it kind of sticks right in their face every day. Uh, prices are starting to stabilize again. They've come down hard initially, and yeah, why risk it? I mean, as David said, I mean, this has been a really important point that almost every Fed governor and Jay Powell himself have talked about. We don't want to be the Arthur Burns 70s where you go up and down. I mean. It's pretty amazing, Jay Powell literally has said that Paul Volcker is the most you know, important public figure in history, okay? Uh, not just in the Fed, but like all public figures, all public servants, and he really wants to model himself uh, after that mantra. So yeah, I, I think that there's very little incentive for them to tell us they're going to pause. They may in fact pause after this hike, but why, why, like, why lead them. that today when the market's up doing what it's doing, the meme stocks are going crazy again. They can't be happy about that. There's just, it's, it's counterproductive to what they're trying to achieve. So yeah, I think yeah. tomorrow's a risk. The idea of Jay Powell looking at AMC and Bed Bath and & Beyond and, <laughs> <laughs> and Tesla and all the runs is it's kind of amusing. Um, but you agree, and that's, that's what is shaping your, you know, obviously shaping your advice to clients. You were saying that for the first time yeah, ever, I, you were making a call on junk bonds. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> looking at the upside and not seeing it. Very much like last year, uh, we argued with clients that 
the upside was really difficult to justify after a 7% inflation year. The Fed wasn't going to be your friend. The Fed put, it, it, this is important, the Fed put is there. It's just the strike price at which that put comes in has dropped a lot. So if there's a catastrophe, whatever that catastrophe may be, and we're down 30, 40 percent in the S&P and the unemployment rate shooting up to six, seven, eight, nine percent, we're losing six, seven hundred thousand jobs. Yeah, there's a Fed put. But we take the unemployment rate up to five and a half from three and a half, kind of gradually, but we lose a lot of jobs. We lose two, three million jobs over the course of a number of quarters. Um, I just don't see why they're going to come in and say that's, that's time for us to be cutting unless inflation is really collapsing. So, you know, I don't, if, when I buy an equity, Melissa, I need to have a great story about why it's going to rally 20% or more. Because I'm taking the riskiest part of the capital structure, I'm buying that, and I need to get return. It's my risk return frontier. If I talk to my mom over Thanksgiving and talking about a stock, it better have a lot of upside. Because she's taking a lot of risk. My mom only likes doubles, by the way. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> I, I expect that. You're, you know, you're an equity strategist. I, I want to do bonds and stuff. Yeah. So. But I, I get you, and I don't see that story. So now I look at the worst bond market in 100 years. I got loan funds. I got high yield bond funds. I got structured credit funds. I got EM and Muni credit funds. I, we can build a portfolio yielding 8, 9, 10% in, in fixed income credit. And if nothing happens, I'm going to collect that coupon. And I'm senior to the equity holder. I'm doing senior loans, senior bonds. If the company goes bankrupt, the equity goes to zero, I own the company. So I've got a better standing in the capital structure, and I'm getting close to equity-like returns, almost double digit. And if I get a little capital gain, because spreads and rates come in a little after the blowout last year, you know, I might get you know, some early teens. That's a good trade to me. That seems like the place to hide in an economy that's not that bad, with really low unemployment, and more importantly, a kind of nominal drift mm -hmm. higher that I think makes it easier to pay your debts. Is there a, a case you can make in favor of equities over the case that David laid out for high yield? It, it seems like a tough sell in this environment. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple other things going on, too. We've had this incredible capital concentration in US-based assets, mainly because uh, the Fed was being extremely accommodative. You know, the money was less than you know zero in terms of its real cost, um, and you had this great tech story. And we have the you know the tech companies are here. So there's been an incredible amount of capital concentration from all over the world. And then of course those stocks had the roughest quarter in the third quarter, and they blew up. The stock market actually didn't even go down. The money reallocated to other parts of the market, and this thing called China came back to life, mm -hmm. like the night of the living dead. Even Europe came back, like European stocks. And that, I too think, is something people have overlooked because we've all just said, oh, well, they're, you know, just buy the S&P 500, just buy the NASDAQ, like why mess around with anything else? But now if that capital is going to reallocate to whether it's fixed income, maybe there's cheaper equities globally because they're in a different part of the recovery cycle. So I think there are things to do, but this, you know, the, the S&P is still a asset that's gotten overvalued, overconcentrated in terms of global participation. The dollar's a big part of that story too. And it's just, it's not done yet. Like that, that's gonna take years, that reallocation of capital to different investments, I think. And we're, we're very much in the same camp as David. In fact, the title of our year ahead, our cross asset piece was the, the year of yield. You know, whether you wanna do it in the front end, uh, you know, risk-free, even taking some duration risk, you know, in the fall, uh, and now uh, getting some spread uh, on top of that, it looks like a pretty good risk reward in a world where most of your risk is in the bottom part of the capital structure. One last thing just on that note, like, like this is a very simple rule that, you know, old guys like us learn over time because you make your mistakes along the way. But like, OK, so here's the sequencing. When you go into a Fed hiking cycle, it's aggressive. You know things are going to slow. Maybe it's a recession. Maybe it's not a recession. But things are slowing. OK, and so the sequencing is very simple. You buy cash first, mm -hmm. then you buy longer duration, then you buy credit, then you buy securitized, and, and then you eventually get to equities. And yet, the whole we're such an equity culture. Everybody's like, I want to buy equities first. Like that's not how it works. Okay, like you got to go through, you got to go through the sequencing, and we're just not there yet. Yeah, and actually, you make that point. Don't buy equities until the Fed puts liquidity back into the system. And yeah. you say that's a long ways off from here. Yeah, I, I, I think the other, you know, just to, to kind of follow up on that, a long way off. You know, there's a lot of folks out there, and you know, we talk about this 
on TV all the time. It's like, there's 50 basis points of rate cuts priced in by the end of the year. And then a bunch of tech guys look around and go, that's great. You know, they're coming back. The liquidity's coming. My stocks are going to rally back. Uh, you know, uh, the last piece I wrote, I tried to really push back on that idea. And even when people say it on, you know, when we're doing these interviews, I think it's really important to understand what's priced in for the Fed. So the, the Fed funds futures say we're going to stop at about 5% in the summer and we're going to be about 4.5% in December, which is we're going to go two, two, two 25s, done, sit, and then we're going to start going down in the fall. That's if you assume like a normal distribution for rates that, 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 that has you know, all these fund properties that we like to use in option pricing theory. The reality, I think, of what's priced into the market is very different. And I think I'm always to say the markets are right, but take a world where you think that the Fed is only there in a catastrophe. Meaning, if there's a catastrophe, they're just gonna go back to zero rates in QE because that's what they do. If there's another COVID, if there's another GFC, if there's an invasion of Taiwan by China, if they're rolling tanks from Russia into Lithuania, then everything's blowing up and the unemployment rates very quickly at seven, eight, nine, they're not gonna go 25, they're not gonna go 50, they're gonna cut a lot. So the probability structure is basically a, a small 10% or less probability of going back to near zero rates and a 90% probability of just staying at five. 90% probability of staying at five is four and a half, 0.9 times five. And basically 10% of going back to zero. That is to me what's priced in to the expectations of the market. This is not a fine tuning Fed. In fact, the, the word fine tuning was considered a dirty word at the Fed after the 70s. It was considered the reason why Arthur Burns failed. That's not where Jay's head is. Jay is not the guy that's gonna go, oh yeah, inflation looks like it's coming down, I'll give you a 25, I'll give you a 50. Jay's got till January 26, and then he's done with his job, he'll be down here golfing, I'm sure, uh, enjoying Florida life. And he does not wanna go down in history as the guy who blew 40 years of inflation fighting credibility. That's what he doesn't want to do. He wants to be the mini Paul Volcker, the guy who crushed the great COVID inflation. So there's central bank heaven, there's central bank hell. Arthur Burns is in central bank hell. You don't want to join him. You want to go to central bank heaven, central bank heaven has Paul Volcker. He's there. If you can just hang out next to him, maybe a rung below, get your statue in there, home run. And I would just add, I mean, they have cover. Too. I mean, yeah. like the like, he signed up to be the bad guy. I mean, they were the meeting. They had Janet Yellen, you know, Biden and and Jay went in there and they said, okay, Jay, you're going to be the bad guy. He's like, fine, I'll be the bad guy. You can blame all the inflation on the Fed. Nothing. This had nothing to do with fiscal stimulus. Wink, wink. Right. <laughs> all the Fed. We're the bad guys. Okay. And so they have cover. And they they they. I mean, there's no there's no disincentive here for him to be a dove. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't exist. It's not like when, you know, the last administration was screaming at him for raising 25 basis points, totally opposite. And so he's got a lot of cover to be the fall guy. And he wants to be the fall guy, kind of. It's kind of, it's, well, it, he, he likes it. Well, I would say, Mike, it, it's important to remember, he's a Republican, right? And, and, and we have a Democratic administration. He has no real incentive to, to help them out that too. during the 2024 yeah. elections. That too. Wait, and I think the he's Fed stayed. is not political, <laughs> David. Stop, Stop Come Melissa. Come on, Stop. you know that. Stop. <laughs> we could go way down that rabbit hole. But, uh, I mean, it's, it is important. He, and, and part of our reason for staying bullish at Jeffries in 2021, even as that inflation data was picking up and everybody was getting nervous and saying the Fed's behind the curve, all you had to do was look at politics. Jay wanted to get his job. His job was coming up in September, so he talked about transitory and climate change and inclusiveness and inequality and all the buzzwords that were going to make Janet Yellen feel comfortable going to Biden and saying, yeah, we can put a Republican in that position. We don't need to put Lael Brainerd. We don't need to put Raphael Bostic. We can do, this will work for us. And the reality was, I don't think they wanted him there because what Democratic administration wants a Republican in during, during the presidential elections but he's there, and it's another reason why he could stay tougher for longer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his, his party is going to expect that of him. And you could say it all you want that it's not political, but when you sit in Washington, D.C., you feel politics <laughs> everywhere, no matter. I mean, do we think our Supreme Court justices don't have political views? Of course they do. 
and so do our Fed governors and presidents. Everybody's human. And I said that very sarcastically, by the way. <laughs> How does corporate America feel lagged effects, Michael? And I'm, I'm asking you this in the context of your call on, on earnings. Um, if it is lagged effects, corporate America could, it could be months and months before they see the worst of things hit them. So how do you factor that in? Yeah, so there's a couple things here. So you know, I was kind of kidding before that the bond market has become somewhat addicted to Fed guidance, right? I mean, every bond person knew the Fed was gonna have to raise more than what they were saying, but nobody wanted to trade it until they told them. And the equity market's the same way. So the equity market is addicted to company guidance, right? It's not a coincidence that the bottoms up analyst estimates basically aligns with company guidance. That's just what it is. And the buy side likes to make fun of the sell side, but the, re the reality is the buy side is the same. Okay, so they're doing the same thing. They're talking to the companies. I don't know a CEO in the country, okay, who says the following. Yeah, you know, the economy's pretty tough. You know, there's this macro environment. We got a war going on and, you know, we're screwed. No, they say the following. They say, this is a really tough macro. But here's what we're going to do to, you know, really execute and, and perform well. And some will do it, but most will not. Because the, what's going on right now in the macro environment is something we've, these companies have never seen in 30 years, which is a volatile you know, supply uh, environment, a volatile inflationary environment, and just getting your costs aligned. Think about the last 30 years. We've been in this suppressed, as David said, lower inflationary world. The, the nominal GDP is like 3 4%. It's boring. Inflation is very predictable. The Fed's guiding you 25 is very, you know, you know, it's very, very predictable. Very predictable environment is a lot easier to run a business than an unpredictable environment. And so just like investors have been shocked by this new world, I think companies are going to be surprised that their, their first step into either cutting labor or forecasting this year is going to be wrong. So our forecast, when we spend a lot of time on this, is one of the areas I have high confidence in for top-down earnings forecasts and they're just significantly below what people are guiding to. So that's where we think the surprise is gonna be. And they'll get past it, they'll eventually adjust, but we gotta go through this valley of very disappointing earnings, and then the question is, will the market look through it and say that's temporary, and they'll eventually get the lower costs, from, you know, costs coming down? I don't think they will. I think the market will price it, and that's why we're probably more negative than, than most people in the short term. You make the point, though, in your model that when the expectations are such a discrepancy, you see the S&P 500 generally go down. Correct. So, I mean, look, models are, you know, not perfect, but our, this particular model is in gear. When I say in gear, meaning, like, it predicts 12 months in advance, and the actual earnings are now literally right on top of what our model's been predicting, meaning it's not different this time, okay? It, it's not different. It's, it's playing out exactly the way we think, and the spread between our model and the consensus is about 25%. The last time that spread was that wide was August of 08, and the time before that was December of 01. Okay, not great. I mean, we know what happened after that because then the earnings get cut and the market adjusts. Now, it doesn't have to be a crash. There's not gonna be a Lehman Brothers like there was in 08, hopefully. There's not gonna be a 9-11 event. I mean, really hope that doesn't happen. So, but the price damage, okay, is going to be significant. It's not 5%. It's gonna be 10 to 20%. Is, and, and I agree with David. Maybe that's just testing the lows in October. You know, we got positive in October for, the, for trade and it worked really well because the price was cheap. It was like 3,500. So, okay, we're going to add risk here. But now we're at 4,100. And, and the meme stocks are going crazy again. There's like silliness all of a sudden back into the marketplace. And so the risk reward at this point is just, it's not October. It's, it's January, price is wrong, earnings are a risk, and, you know, I'd rather own bonds. Um, That's the equity guy. We're, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> we're, we're just about well, out of time, but I do want to ask you guys, because I know for a fact that on Fast Money, we sort of tilt bearish also. We get a lot of flack from the audience. Why are you guys so <laughs> bearish? You're always wrong. You're constantly down. Get somebody bullish on your show, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to be a bear these days in a world that loves equity. So when you travel around the country, you talk to clients, what is a number one sort of misconception that you think people have about this time around? What do you think people want to hold on to but you think is absolutely wrong in their assessment of the, of the markets? So I, I, don't, I don't know that I see, I, I think people are holding on to the idea that the Fed's coming to their rescue early and they're not. And they're missing, Melissa, something even more important, which is what the Fed is doing is giving you tough love. They are anchoring long-run inflation expectations and have anchored them at about 2%. And if they let that go, if we decided to have a central bank like the one in Turkey or Argentina, you could kiss this equity market goodbye because we would have multiples in the single digits. 
like we did in the 70s. So for the long run equity investor, this Fed is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. If your horizon is 10 or 20 years, you're buying because of what Jay Powell does. But if you're gonna try to get out of the way of an occasional you know, steamroll against you, this is not the year to be the hero as he's giving you that tough love. We have to take the tough love. We had two back-to-back -back seven handle inflation years. You gotta do it. Otherwise, you will go down a very dark emerging market style path. That's what I tell investors. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, and I would just say that the, the biggest pushback we get is that, you know, everybody's negative. And it's true, like some people, I, I mean, even clients, I mean, institutional clients are pretty negative. Even the retail community is somewhat bearish, okay? But you know what, the consensus is right 80% of the time. Like, sometimes it's right to be bearish, you know? I mean, like, it's not great. And, um, and I would say that in the last month, that bearishness has shifted back to not wildly bullish, but like, you know, not being analytical about the combination of a Fed that's not your friend and perhaps the earnings story that we're trying to tell. So, you know, patience is a virtue. By the way, you get paid four and a half percent in the T-bill. You know, it's not so bad. You know, just kind of be patient. Don't be need to be the first one into the pool. Uh, there'll, there'll, there'll be time for the party later. 10% in a senior loan fund. 10% wow. in a senior loan fund. Some great advice. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank David you. Zerbos, Thanks, Mike Wilson. Thanks. That's fun, Mike. Yeah, good to see you, David. Good to see you.